Adventist Spiritual Ministries has as, it, as its motto, touching hearts, changing lives. And we hope, providing hope and help for those affected by incarceration. And so from week to week, is what our volunteers do as we go into the prisons, allowing the Lord to use us, guided by the Holy Spirit, as we touch hearts and change lives. And in many of our churches right now and right here in the Washington Conference, there are individuals who are members of our church whose hearts were touched whose lives were changed by Adventist prison ministry being used by the Holy Spirit. Before I go into my sermon today, I just want to invite Charlie Williamson to come up here a minute. Come up, Charlie. And Charlie's uh, one of our volunteers, and he worked inside as well as outside the prison. And I'm going to ask Charlie just in a few minutes to tell us something, share with us some of his experiences as a volunteer, not only as working in the prisons, but also working outside now. Well, I was, uh, I originally started doing volunteer work at Adventist Prison Ministries about 18, 18 or 19 years ago, and I was sitting in a church just like this. And there was a few volunteers that had already been formed a team to go into Monroe Correctional Complex. And one of them came up to me and said, uh, Hey, Charlie, how would you like to go into the prison with us? I started looking around like, You talking to me? And I, it surprised me. I didn't know. So they said, Well, think about it. And I started thinking about it, and then I even prayed about it, and I prayed to God. I said, God, is this what you want me to do? If this is what you want me to do, I'm willing, and I'll do it. But I'm going to need your power to direct me, to give me the words, to give me the attitude, to give me everything I need to do this for you. And so that's where it all started. And I went into Monroe for over almost 15 years, going in the walls and... As a volunteer, I became a sponsor. Uh, you had to be a sponsor to actually go in and sponsor groups if you're just a volunteer. There had to be a sponsor or you couldn't even go into these programs. So I thought it was my duty to become a sponsor and I did that for years and became a, uh, the leader of the group for Monroe when there was about probably 20 people with minist music ministry and everything. Through the chaplain and the grace of God, we actually went from one Sabbath service in one institution to two, uh, getting one finally at WSR just a few years ago. And Charlie, right now you are not going into the prison, but tell us what you are doing on the outside. Well, I coordinate. Floyd, Floyd alerts me to things with families of the inmates that are on the outside uh, is part of the job that I do periodically, but mostly I'm working with Hope House right now. I'm on the oper operations committee with... Uh, Nelson Miles and a number of other people, and we're, we're building this transitional house. It's in the remodeling process right now. And we're counting on God to give us resources and energy and uh, select the, the people that will come to utilize this transitional house to, to make a difference in their lives because it's tough for them to come out and I'm Back to what you're doing on site, too. One of the things we have to be well, he is such an important person, and we hope to have a few other volunteers like that, like him too, is that the Department of Corrections, when you're a volunteer and you're going inside, you're into the prison, um, you cannot really be connecting or with that inmate's family or relatives already on the outside. So very often, there are some inmates who want to have their, you know, prayer, want their family to study in the Bible and to have visits from members of our church. And Charlie 
fits into that role because he's not going into any of the prisons. Mm -hmm. And he's done a fantastic job in that area. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm, thank you. And so you can pray for the ministry, you can actually pray for the, the ministry, you can make, as Pastor Dula mentioned in the video, you can make a financial contribution, you can become a volunteer, you can support um, the ministry even by helping on the outside. And again, we'll talk more about that during the pot, after the potluck. That's more Hayes. <coughs> Father in heaven, as we open your word, may your Holy Spirit touch us. Draw each one of us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our scripture reading, very interesting story there. If Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 37, the sort of question is, can these bones live again? Have you ever been faced with a seemingly hopeless situation? One where everything you did seemed to be no avail? The odds were so much against you that you wanted to give up? Ezekiel, the prophet, did. He wanted to see a revival in the land, but the people, the children of Israel, were refusing to repent. His ministry seemed, at one point in time, his ministry seemed for no good purpose. So God lets Ezekiel know that there was, there would be a revival in the land. The aim of the vision, which Ezekiel had, was originally given to counteract the despair and pessimism which seemed to have been taking hold of Ezekiel. And for us today, it is a message of hope. No matter how hopeless a situation might seem, I am here to tell you that we serve a God who restores life. That we have a God who can even make dry bones live again. In verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel begins to report a spiritual, on a spiritual experience where God's spirit placed him in the valley of dry bones. And there he says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full. Of bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel is saying. And this seems to be his usual expression whenever he was in a vision. It indicates a powerful prophetic awakening and inspiration. He was transported by the Spirit of the Lord in the middle of a valley which was filled with human bones. These bones were dried. They looked as if they were bleach. They looked as if some of them were actually beginning to decay. They were scattered all around. And all around the prophet were dead bones. And the total absence, absence of life. The bones were very dry. At this time of the story, Israel was a defeated nation. 
Israel had been crushed militarily. Its people had been separated from one another in exile. And it had suffered the inevitable result of its abandonment of, abandonment of the Lord. Alone, exhausted, discouraged, and impoverished, Israel was as good as dead. But God had other plans. The control of history had something in mind for his people that they couldn't even have imagined. Especially since most of them had retained very little knowledge of the promises of God. And that one day he would bring them back from exile. They may have forgotten God. And sometimes we as human beings tend or behave as if we forget God. And forget that there's a God. But the good news this morning is that God had not forgotten the children of Israel. And even although we may behave as if we have forgotten God, I am here this morning to tell you that God never forgets us. God calls Ezekiel in verse 2 to inspect the bones. In verse 2 he says, He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. So here is God in this vision giving Ezekiel a tour in that valley of dry bones. And all he could see as he walked all around was bones, 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 dry bones. The bones are very dry. They were scattered all around. Bones... It had been a long time, though it seems that the bones were there a long time. And as he saw, again, he saw the absence of life. If these people had been sick or dying, perhaps there might have been some hope. Ezekiel probably at that time may have gotten some hope if there were people who were there dying, sick and dying, they still had a little life in them, but there was just bones, bones, dry bones. Hopeless and desperate situation. Any human suggestion that these bones could ever come to life again would probably sound very preposterous. These are situations which appear to be totally and absolutely hopeless to natural man. But with God, all things are possible. We have a great God. That song, that hymn we just sang so lustily and so beautifully, how great thou art. We serve a God who is great. And so in verse 3, God asked the prophet a surprising question. Now here is God, here is Ezekiel in vision walking through these, among these bones. And then in verse 3, God asked him a surprising question. He said to him, son of man, can these bones live? The NIV puts it, the answer that way, that uh, Ezekiel says, I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. I like how the New, the, the new Living Translation puts it. It says, uh, then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? 
Ezekiel answers, O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. I love how that, how that version puts it. And as Ezekiel surveyed the scene in the valley, in order to emphasize the total void of life apart from God, the Lord asked Ezekiel this question, Can these bones live? And the prophet's answer was restrained and filled with the awareness of human helplessness in the face of death. After all, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 24, the Bible tells us that Ezekiel had just lost his, his dear wife. She had died. And that loss still pounded in his heart. But he also had respect for the unfathomable fathomable, hidden power of God. Was there potential of life or for life in these bones? Ezekiel knew that humanly speaking, it was impossible. Ezekiel's answer revealed that it would require a power beyond man's to bring about life. That is why he said, you alone know that answer. It was an answer of reverence. Realizing the omnipotent all-powerfulness and all-knowingness of God. It was not a positive or negative response. He knew that if these bones can live again, it was a matter only God knew. And that the giving of life was a deed only God could perform. And that's why he answered like that. Most Israelites may have doubted God's promise of restoration even at that time. Their present condition mitigated against the possibility of that being fulfilled. So God stressed the fact of his sovereign power and ability to carry out these remarkable promises. The fulfillment depended upon God. You know, sometimes... As we attempt to minister and share the good news of the gospel to other people. Sometimes we ourselves may find it a little bit discouraging when people are not responding in the way that we want them to respond. And sometimes some people may be so uh, deep and, uh, in their sins and, and dead to the truth of God that sometimes we feel like giving up and wondering if these people could ever be saved. But the good news is, with God, all things are possible. Can they have a spiritual life? Can they be revived? Only God can accomplish that. As the Holy, Word, Holy Spirit touches men's, men and women's heart, yes, dry bones can live again. And so in verse 4, God tells him, having asked him if these bones can live, and he said, only you, are, you alone know God. Then God say, said to him, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Prophesy to them and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So God speaks to Ezekiel again and tells him to prophesy over these bones. Ezekiel, in his ministry, I guess that many times in his ministry, he felt he was preaching to the dead when the children of Israel were not responding to him. But now he was really speaking to the dead. Dry bones. He was told to address the dry bones and to tell them to hear the word of the Lord. 
And then verse 5 says, This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. And the word of the Lord was a promise to cause breath to enter into them that they might come to life. And the set of, you know, I mean, talking about this act of, of breathing the breath of life into, into a man, you, 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 you go back in your memory, you reflect and remember the creation story. For in creating man, God transformed Adam into a living being by breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. And here Ezekiel is being told, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may, what? Come to life. Restoration. God is in the restoration business. He wants to bring back those dead bones to life. He wants to bring back us Alive, spiritually, to be spiritually alive with him. So God is going to give life to these dead bones. God's spirit was going to create life in these scattered dead bones. And the dry bones represented people's, the children of Israel's spiritually dead condition. You know, Sometimes, even the church may appear to be filled of dead bones. Sometimes, we are so sp- appear to be so spiritually dead. That we are like the dead bones in that body. But God promised to restore and bring back life to those dead bones in that body to restore the, the, the children of Israel. And the same God that was there is here today. God can restore our church. God can Breathe that life back into us so that we can become spiritually awake. But we have to be willing to allow him to breathe that breath back into us. So I say to all of us then, let us pray for renewal. Let us pray that all of us will allow God to put his spirit into us so that this church can become that vibrant spiritual church that God wants it to be. In fact, God is at work calling his people back to himself. But in order to bring life into spiritually dead people and spiritually dead churches, we must be open for the indwelling of the power of the Holy Spirit. Then verse 6. Verse 6 says, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to light. And then you will know that I am the Lord. And verse 7 says, So I prophesied, and as I, as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Through prophesying over those bones, Ezekiel obeyed God without doubt, without comment. And the results of the word of God were startling. 
while Ezekiel was preaching, a rumbling or shaking started all over the valley. That's why we get that really love, that nice song, them bones. The foot bone connected to the leg bone. The leg bone connected to the knee bone. The knee bone connected to the thigh bone. The thigh bone connected to the back bone. The back bone connected to the neck bone. The neck bone connected to the head bone. Or oh, hear the word of the Lord. You remember that there are 206 bones in the human body. So there had to be a lot of noise in that valley that day. As all those bones were coming together, as Ezekiel spoke God's word, they had, you know, no wonder it's mentioned here that uh, as he did it, there was a rattling sound as the bones came together. 206 bones and each human being. In the midst of the shaking or thundering, the bones began to approach one another. It was as though they were guided by an intelligent design. The bones came together exactly the right way and proportion to form normal human beings. Normal human beings' skeletons. And though the bones had come together, they were not alive. Isn't that interesting? That these bones came together, formed a skeleton, but they were not alive. There was no breath in them. And so in verse 8, the Bible says, I look, and the tendons of flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And verse 9 says, Then he says to me, said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds of breath and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army. Praise the Lord. This is the God we serve. And the same God who brought those dead bones alive is still in the miracle working business today. We see as we enter the prisons, we see as we enter the jails, individuals who are written off by society, written off by their families, written off by their friends, people who are hopeless. And the word of God, taken to them by our volunteers and the Holy Spirit using the words to touch their hearts, giving their lives to Jesus Christ, tears running down their eyes as they stand up and share their testimony before other inmates. God is great. So Ezekiel did as the Lord will say, said. And before he breathed that, that, that breath of life, and it says, it must say that although those bones came together, Ezekiel wisely didn't mistake commotion for regeneration. He listened. And he followed God's orders. And then, step by step, as Ezekiel preached, as God commanded, and that massive graveyard of lifeless bodies came to life because the breath of the divine spirit came into them. What a dramatic transformation from death to life. What a dramatic transformation we see in the lives of men and women who have lived lives of crime, made some, made mistake, messed up, messed up, up, messed up day after day or year after year, and see no hope in their lives. 
But then the word of God comes. And they respond to the word of God. And you see that transformation is like transformation from life to death. God takes and turns a valley of dry bones into a living army. Such is the boundless power of the word of God and the spirit of the living God working together in his people. You know, Romans chapter 8 declares that the spirit is life. And such life is what God wants to bring about today. Such life is what God wants to bring about in each one of us today. He wants to breathe his divine spirit into our lives and turn his church into a living army that will go out and bring the victory of Christ to the world. A church that will receive the Lord's power in order to go out in that power and that can set the captives free, bind up the brokenhearted, and lift up the downtrodden. It will be an army that will proclaim that this is the acceptable year of the Lord. A.W. Tozer, in an article written in Christianity Today, volume 41, article entitled Born After Midnight, he said, Religious instruction, however sound, is not enough by itself. It brings light, but it cannot impart light. The assumption that light and sight are synonymous has brought spiritual tragedy to millions. The Pharisees look straight at the light of the world. But not one ray of light reached their inner being. Light is not enough. The inward operation of the Holy Spirit is necessary to save in faith. And another way of saying this, being a baptized somebody of this church member, coming to church every Sabbath or every Sunday night or, or, or every Wednesday night is no guarantee that we are going to be saved. If I stand in a garage, it does not make me a car. It is more than this. As we come to church, as we read the Bible, we have to internalize this. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. It calls for a complete surrender. And this is what we are talking about here, that at this point of time, God wants that full surrender, that total surrender. Like Paul, we need to die, save, die daily and to make that complete surrender to Jesus Christ. This is what God wants for his church. And then verse 11 relays that the dry bones came to life are figurative of the resurrection of God's people of the nation of Israel. He said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope have perished. We are completely cut off. But then God interprets that vision for Daniel, for Ezekiel. For the vision was God's response to the people's sin and their hopeless situation. There will come a time when they, the people of Israel, will see their destitute condition and confess that their bones are dried up, their hope are perished, they are completely cut themselves off, and they really need God. You know, God had actually, in Ezekiel chapter 36, before that, had actually made some promises because in Ezekiel 36, 27, he said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave you to give to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. 
God had reminded them of those promises before. But the problem is that they had turned their backs on God. And here's it. That sin and bread in the heart of man has brought about the death. Did bring about the death of uh, the death of the nation of Israel at that time, so to speak. The, uh, that vision, the dead bones. But what God is here saying is that there is hope for the hopeless. For God who gives life through His new covenant produces spiritual life to those who are spiritually dead. Dead bones can live again. Have you ever felt that the whole world is caving in around you and there's absolutely no hope? That your troubles seem to mount up insurmountably? Cheer up. I have good news for you. In Christ, there's hope for the hopeless. God said he would bring them out Restore them, and he will still be their God. So I'm saying to us today that when the seemingly impossible happens, Ezekiel, in this year, when we look at verse 13, Ezekiel there is telling us when the seemingly impossible happens, we will know, it says, then you will know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves and caused you to come out of your graves, my people. There is no finer illustration of the life-changing power of the preached word than what the prophet saw in that vision. The gospel has power to transform those who are dead in trespasses and sin. And make them new living creatures in Jesus Christ. That is what this passage is telling us today. Without God's presence, the nation was dry bones. However, God promises to open those walking tombs by reanimating them with his divine spirit. And when that happens, change will come. And verse 14 tells us, it says here, And I will put my spirit within you, you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. And so as we look back over these 14 verses, I would like for us to consider the situation that Ezekiel was facing. I would like for us to consider what Ezekiel was told to do about it. And I'd like for us to consider that God's promise was eventually fulfilled. That God kept his promise. So as we reflect this, on this part, the content of this passage, I'd like for us to look at our situation at this time. And I'd like, us for us to, like for us to responsibly apply these messages that we have gotten there to our situation in Renton, and to our situation in the Washington Congress. And as we think of what happened there in Ezekiel, we realize that God is a God who keeps his promises. We realize that God is a God who never gives up on us. Even when we give up on him, he does not give up on us. Ezekiel did not raise the people from the dead. That was God's work. Yes, Ezekiel spoke, but the power was in the word of God. Through the preaching of God's word, that which appeared to be impossible became possible. The word of God makes it all happen. Now, if Ezekiel had refused to say anything, if he had refused to preach the word, the bones would still have been there. But what an encouraging picture 
not only for the nation of Israel, not only, not only for Ezekiel, but also for us. This is encouraging us to keep preaching the word of God. This is encouraging us to keep spreading the word of God. This is encouraging us that day by day as we go about our duties, wherever we are, we must look for opportunities to spread the word of God. To tell others about the good news of salvation. To tell others that God loves them. To tell others that Jesus died on Calvary's cross for our sins and because of that we can have everlasting life. To tell others that Jesus is soon coming. We learn from the Valley of Dry Bones, therefore, that the Word of God is able to bring about strength and comfort and power in a hopeless situation. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God gives us hope through his word. And as we close, the question is, where do we fit in here? I know there are times when you feel that we are in a hopeless situation and we are in the middle of it. We don't always see the big picture. But sometimes we may get so overwhelmed to the point that we don't see the other side. Some time ago I read about a young lawyer who slipped into a state of depression. It got to the point where his closest friends were keeping all knives and razors away from him for fear that he would hurt himself. It was bad. And in his, and, and in his journal he wrote, I am now the most miserable man living. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I fear I shall not. Perhaps some of you have been in a similar situation. And there are times when life seems hopeless. And no matter how optimistic we try to be, we cannot see through the other side. But when we get to that point, Ezekiel would encourage us to turn to the Lord and listen to the Lord. And by the way, that, that attorney was a young man by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And thankfully, Abraham Lincoln found a way to come true on the other side. Perhaps we look at a friend or a loved one and we wonder if they will ever make the choice to follow God. And our responsibility is to listen to God's word and to realize that God's word brings hope even to the most hopeless situations. One Archer video. We call it having a trick baby. Two strangers meet for a business transaction and there's a mistake. The pimp said, you can't make any money having a baby in the oven. We have got to kill this baby. They kicked her in the stomach. They fed her alcohol. They gave her drugs. They took a hanger and stabbed the baby over and over again. But the baby would not die. The baby was born two months premature with no pancreas, a learning disability, a bladder too small, unable to function, a severe stutterer. We call it a trick baby nobody wants the baby no hope no future kill it was the word that baby was me I'm the lowest of the low I come from the guttermost I come from a hellish condition and so when I would go to school I couldn't talk I stuttered so severely from the trauma my mother had a madam who hated men her name was Dolores and she was a sadist and when she would watch me she would take a broomstick and stick it in a place where no boy should have any object in his body and when you are tortured like that you learn four things don't talk don't trust 
don't feel and pretend nothing is happening. And by age 10, I had had enough. I wanted to die. And in my school, they put me in a boiler room with other kids who were dysfunctional like me, where we would finger paint all day long. And yet there was a teacher, thank God for her, who had a Gideon Bible. And she came to my school, and she saw kids like me as her mission field. And she would give me this Gideon Bible and read to me stories of dysfunctional characters who God used. She would say to me, Ronaldo, God uses greatly those who have been wounded very deeply. He will turn your pain into power, your wounds into wisdom. She had me read the story of Moses, who was also a stutterer. I began to understand that God did love a trick baby, even as low as I was. There was hope for me and possibility. And when a child begins to understand the love of God and the power of his word and the possibilities, it changes everything. How can a young man keep his way clean by taking heed according to your word? Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. I began to memorize the Bible, that Gideon Bible, reading 2,000 scriptures. And when you put that kind of word in a life, something begins to happen. My stuttering went away. I stopped wetting the bed. I stood tall. I became valedictorian, became a pastor and priest until everybody in my family got saved. Why? Because somebody placed a Gideon Bible in a woman's hand that changed a life forever. Yes! I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the devil because of you and the power of the word of God. The word of God is powerful. Let us spread the word of God. Can these bones live again? Yes. We serve a God who can make these bones live again.